It is Sunday morning and I am actually going to a friend's house. My hair looks crazy. Um, going to a friend's house and we went to the farmer's market, which is sort of my Sunday morning habit. And right now, stone fruits, i.e. peaches, plums, apricots, nectarines, they're in season. And I always like to cook in season. Hey, sun titled. And so I thought, why not make some peach cobbler? Um, hey, Evie and DSD. I actually made some peach cobbler last weekend for two pool parties that I went to and the peach cobbler was the runaway hit. Hey guys. Um, so I thought let's make some peach cobbler together, right? Um, hi everyone. Hi, hi, hi. So we've got a bunch of peaches here. I actually have a mix of different peaches, um, which seemed to work out really well last time. Hey, just Chloe. Hey, Nikki. Hey radio. Oh, I love peach cobbler too. I have just regular yellow peaches, and then I also have some white peaches. So if you haven't had white peaches before, they're uh, a little bit sweeter, less tart. There's almost no tartness in a white peach. And then the yellow peaches, you're gonna get that traditional tart plus sweet flavor, at least if they're good. <laughs> um, these were really good. Like I said, I had these last week and they were amazing. So, hey, uh, from da uh, New York, David Prez, hey, uh, Sushmita, Skylar, uh, hey from Skylar, hello, all of you guys, I'm so excited to be making this peach cobbler with you all on live. I know I like never do live. I love peach cobbler, I attempt to make it, you attempt to. Well, this time we're gonna do it together so that when you try to make it again, it will come out perfectly. So in terms of how many peaches, I just kind of like eyeball it. Um, my recipe usually calls for about three to four large peaches for the filling. And then I also save a little bit for the top. I do think it's important to put some peaches on the top of your cobbler so that people know, oh, this is a peach cobbler, as opposed to a berry cobbler or an apple cobbler or you know a cherry cobbler, because there's so many different kinds of cobbler. Hey, from Croatia, unless you put the fruit on top of it or you somehow label your cobbler, people may, may not know what is in it. I'm having chop chip for breakfast. I'm jealous. I had a blueberry muffin and a bagel sandwich for breakfast today. What did you all have for breakfast? Hello from Texas. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make the filling first. And um, what you want is to get sort of a large bowl. I have a very large bowl here and to it, I'm just going to add my peaches. And let's see if I can show you guys here how I cut my peaches. Okay, Ah, uh, sorry guys. I'm using my phone to do this. Okay, so um, that is my cutting board and we're just gonna cut up all these peaches. I like to keep the skin on my peaches. I don't know about you, um, but that is my preference. I don't like to get rid of the skin. Um, a little extra fiber for you there. So let's keep that and then let's open this peach up. Look at that. So that is a white peach. I don't know how many of you have had white peaches before. I know in a lot of Asian cultures, white peaches are sort of the standard and the yellow peaches are the more exotic, if you will. So growing up, I used to have lots of white peaches and I thought they were the best peaches. Um, but, you know, since then, I would have to say my appreciation for the traditional American or Western style peach, which is the uh, yellow peach, has definitely increased. <laughs> um, hi from Maryland. Um, I may have, but I don't eat peaches much. Yeah, you know, I was just talking to a friend of mine today. She said that she's slightly allergic to peaches. I did not know this, but um, from a kind of um, chemical standpoint, peaches are made up of ingre an ingredient, I guess a protein that's very similar to uh, pollen, bee pollen. And as a result, people who tend to be, you know, hay fevery, uh, they get that sort of... Uh, sneeziness during the spring because of all the pollen. Um, they also tend to have a slightly allergic reaction to peaches. So their throats will get itchy, you know, they'll kind of be coughing and sneezing and again, hay fevery, which I thought was very interesting. 
Um, I love your recipes so much. I use them almost every day. Oh my God, that's so amazing. Thank you so much. Hello from the Philippines. So as you can see, I'm sort of cutting up the peaches in bite-sized pieces. I don't like to cut them up too small, but I've also determined that cutting them up too big, it just, uh, it makes for a very messy cobbler. So we're going to cut them up into bite-sized pieces. Hold on, guys. Let me just get my little pastry thing here so I can scoop up all the peaches and we're going to put them into our bowl here. There we go. And let's cut up a yellow peach. See what that looks like on the inside. I think that's like half the fun is doing this. Ooh, that looks really gorgeous, doesn't it? They look like apples. <laughs> Loads of love from India. Oh, thank you. Unfortunately, I have to go somewhere. Oh, that's okay, Bluebell. I'm going to be posting this on my channel so you guys can refer back to it. If you guys try this recipe at home, I want to make sure that you feel like you have a reference. All right, so again, we're just going to cut this up into bite-sized pieces. There we go. I love peaches, but I have to say, just like any other fruit or produce, um, like I, I really don't like bad peaches. I don't know about you guys, but I can't stand when the peach is like tasteless, <laughs> like has no flavor, um, or it's just like totally sweet. Um, that drives me crazy. But I do want to ask if any of you guys have a preference for like hard peaches or do you want your peach to be like totally like sugary and soft on the inside because I think people have very strong opinions about that I tend to like my peaches kind of sweet and soft like almost kind of falling apart you can see how it it's, it's so sugary over here that's actually become a little bit translucent I don't mind that but when it comes to my nectarines I want my nectarines to be really really hard like rock hard uh, can I use nectarines instead of peaches? You know, that's a good question. I've never used nectarines for a peach cobbler recipe. I think you can certainly cut in some nectarines. Um, I think that the only concern there is, of course, nectarines have you know less sugar and they also have less liquid. And you know, part of you know the joy of cutting into a cobbler is that delicious soupiness. Um, that you get that caramelizes and turns almost into a syrup um, that really helps to macerate the, uh, the peaches while it's baking in the oven. So that would be my only concern, but I, I encourage you to at least try cutting in maybe a nectarine uh, mixed together with peaches. I think that would be fine. Um, oh my God, that peach looks amazing. Yes, these are so good. I don't like them too soft and too mushy. Yes, some people have very, you know, they don't like that. They like to eat their peaches like apples. I like to eat my nectarines like apples. In fact, I was just telling my friend, look at that, look at that. Wow, <laughs> um, that looks amazing. I, uh, oh my God, <sighs> this tastes like candy. Mm. So good. <laughs> it's almost like midnight. I got my peaches out in Georgia. Wow, I've never actually had a Georgia peach before. Um, gotta rectify that. I imagine that they taste especially good. Um, I did go peach picking once with my family in St. Louis, of all places. I did not realize that St. Louis was like a hub of peach orchards here in the United States, but uh, apparently it is. So I did that once, and I have to say they were the best peaches I ever had in my life. Um, my brother and I had so many peaches. Like, I think we ate like eight peaches in a span of one hour because we were just picking them off the trees and then just eating them. They were like so good. Um, and so I don't know what that is. That looks a little bit not good. So I'm just going to cut that out. Yeah, I'm just cut that out and use the rest of it because the rest of it looks good. Um, but we went and we, we went to the peach orchard, with my whole family, like my cousins, my grandma, my aunt, my uncle, my mom, my dad, and we were just picking, um, peaches off the tree and just eating them. And like, you know, when you do that, you have the tendency to like lose track of the, 
you know, number of peaches you've eaten. And that's exactly what we did. We all lost track of the peaches that we ate and we got so sick because we ate like eight peaches, each of us, in such a short period of time. And then we had to drive home for seven hours back to Chicago and we were all sick in the car. <laughs> but the peaches were so good. As soon as we got home, we just ate more peaches. <laughs> um, that's how good the peaches were. Okay, so we've cut up all the peaches. Um, look at how gorgeous that looks. Yeah, I was about to say, my grandmother would take me to pe pecans at the Grape Orchard, but I've never seen peaches keep sharing more stories. They're really inspiring. Well, thank you so much. Is this actual live? No, this is definitely live. Um, so we've got, look at that. Wow, look at these peaches. Okay, so we've got all these peaches. And then we've got to add a little bit of flavor, just a little bit of flavor to these peaches. And one of the things that I like to do is I like to use this pumpkin pie spice. I find that the spices that are included in this blend are actually the same spices that I would love to put into my peach cobbler, which is cinnamon, a little bit of ginger, a little bit of uh, cloves, a little bit of allspice. So this is a great little blend. But if you don't have a pumpkin spice blend, just put, you know, a little bit of cinnamon, maybe some nutmeg, um, clove, although, you know, with clove, be very, very careful. Clove is very, very powerful. Um, so you wanna be careful with how much clove you put in. And now, guys, I'm gonna take you into my pantry. Hello, yum, I love pumpkin spice. Yes, exactly, you can, you can always have pumpkin spice. It's not just in the fall. We're gonna get a little bit of cornstarch, okay? And we're also gonna get a little bit of brown sugar, okay? Pathetic but aesthetic, Joanne, help. I'm going to go fruit picking this week. What fruit is good this time of year? Well, in California, peaches are like golden right now. Peaches are really, really, peaches, plums, apricots, nectarines, those are the things that are in season here. I just went to the farmer's market and I talked to the fruit people and they're like, that's what's in season. Everything else is sort of going out of season, um, like the cherries and the, um, what's it called? What uh, The grapefruits and the citrus fruits. Those are kind of going out of season and they're being replaced by the stone fruits. And then, you know what else has been particularly good have been the blackberries. So we've been eating a lot of blackberries and raspberries, but I feel like berries are oftentimes good all year round, depending on where you get them from. So I would stick to the stone fruits right now. Hopefully that is good. I love how calm this stream is. Oh my God, is our stream supposed to be anti-calm? <laughs> okay, so we've got that. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna add just a little bit of extra sweetener to help it out. If you don't want to add this, you don't have to. So I'm just gonna add a couple tablespoons of regular sugar, okay? I'm also going to add a couple tablespoons of brown sugar. I love adding brown sugar to these types of um, more rustic, I guess, uh, desserts or, you know, sweets. And the reason for that is because, um, you know, some of these uh, more fancy, like cakes and, you know, souffles and things like that, you got to be very careful with the sugar content because sugar acts not just as a sweetener, but it, you know, has a chemical reaction with the other ingredients and will affect moisture. It will affect, uh, you know, bounciness and crumb. But this is just a cobbler. This is nothing fancy. Um, and therefore you can add kind of, you can really adjust the level of sweetness based upon how sweet you like your desserts. And I love adding brown sugar because it tends to kind of add an earthiness or like a, almost like a caramelized, uh, caramelly flavor to the cobbler. Um, but some people don't like that. They like to add just the white sugar and, or no sugar whatsoever. I would be careful about adding a syrup as your sweetener, just because syrups are a liquid. And you're already, you're already gonna get a ton of liquid coming from the peaches, at least if they're in season like mine. Um, so you do wanna be careful about you know making sure that it isn't so soupy uh, that you end up with a soup instead of a cobbler. So just be careful of that. And speaking of liquid, this is why we're gonna add a little bit of the cornstarch. So we're gonna add two tablespoons of cornstarch. And again, the reason for that is to make sure that to the extent there is liquid that's gonna seep out of your peaches, you want it to thicken into, again, that lovely caramelized mixture that's not gonna overwhelm the baked part of your goods. Okay, so we're just gonna give this 
good mix here. I'm gonna make sure that our peaches are sort of evenly coated with that cornstarch and all of those seasonings, those spices that went into our punk pumpkin spice blend. Okay, so that's good. And then what we're gonna do is we're going to grab the container for our peach cobbler. And in this situation, I'm just gonna use a deep cast iron pan. I find that this, again, promotes that rustic aesthetic for purposes of our peach cobbler. I just think it's really beautiful. But also I like, again, sort of the heat that comes from the cast iron while it's baking. It helps to promote that caramelization. So we're just gonna pour it right in into our pan here. There we go. Done with that bowl. All right, so now that we've poured our peach cobbler filling into our pan, and I'm gonna give you a top-down view. Is this peach cobbler? Um, you know what, I've never had peach pie, E-Radio, so um, I've never made it, I should say. Uh, and, and I guess the main difference is that the pie crust is gonna be you know, a flaky, you know, traditional pie crust, whereas the topping for this pie, or this cobbler, is gonna be more cake, like a cake-like thing. So we've got this beautiful filling going. And again, for those of you who are just joining us, let's kind of recap what we have in here. We have probably about five large peaches in here. Um, and there would be a mix of your yellow peaches along with white peaches. We've added to that a couple tablespoons of white sugar along with a couple tablespoons of brown sugar, two tablespoons of cornstarch, and a very healthy dose of pumpkin spice blend, which is a blend of cinnamon, nutmeg, allspice, um, ginger, to just give it that little kick. Now here, what I would also do if I had time or if I actually had a lemon, I would probably give a little squeeze of lemon juice to make sure that our uh, peaches stay nice and you know uh, fresh. Uh, but I don't have lemon juice and I think that's gonna be fine. I made it without lemon juice last week and it was totally fine. Could I do it in a cake baking tray? Absolutely, Patricia. I have done it in a cake baking tray as well. I, I'm mostly just using this for the aesthetic. It just looks so impressive when it comes out of the oven. All right, so next what we're gonna do is I have here two tablespoons of cold butter, okay? And what I've done is I've cut them up into these tiny little cubes, and this is what I'm just gonna drop these in, like little, little butter pe presents <laughs> to my peaches. And I would do this in lieu of melting the butter and adding it to the peach filling. I think that this helps to like the timing of the melting. The problem that I imagine when you melt the butter and you just add it is that it immediately makes the filling too heavy. And then the baked part on top, the cake part, has a tendency to get weighed down by the melted butter. This way, when you have the butter kind of or like you know cold or at least solid, um, it's going to take a little bit of time when it's in the oven to melt and mix together and create that again buttery caramelized. Um, texture together with the sugars that we put in here. The, together with the sugars we've added, like the brown sugar, uh, as well as the sugars that are naturally going to come out of the peaches. Sometimes I add lemon to the peach cobbler to provide exactly ADC, ADC. I would as well. Uh, I just don't, I never seem to have lemons when I need them. And then I always end up having like 20 lemons when I don't need them. So I'm just gonna wash my hands. They're covered in butter. And then what we're gonna do is we are going to move on to making the cake batter that we're gonna spoon over the top to make the cakey part of our cobbler. So I'm gonna put this aside. Just FYI guys, I have my oven preheating to about 400 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you are doing this prior to even starting, your peach filling mixture, you probably want to get going with uh, preheating your oven because 400, I don't know about you guys, but 400 for me takes a long time. All right, so I've got like a medium-sized bowl here. 
And we're gonna start with our dry ingredients, which I like to do separately from our wet ingredients. Okay, I thought that was cheese. No, that was butter. Can you substitute coconut sugar for brown sugar? I think that's a perfect substitution tab tab. Uh, do you use frozen peaches? I use fresh peaches, because again, they're in season right now, and then I wanted to take advantage of that, Lydia. But if you know peaches are not in season and you wanna make this in the dead of winter, I think using frozen ones are fine. Um, I think using both are fine, but fresh peaches, exactly. I totally agree with you. It really depends on you know, what time of year. Uh, if I tried to buy peaches here at the you know supermarket in the middle of December, they're gonna taste horrible. So, <laughs> so I think it sort of depends. All right, let's start with the dry ingredients. We have about, let's see, 150 grams of uh, flour. And let me pull out my cookbook here. And I got this, this is actually the cake recipe for one of the uh, recipes in my cookbook. That's, that's the part that I use to make the cake part. So a hundred and, oh, so 105 grams, I should say, of, um, actually, I did not use 105 grams. This is about a half a cup. This is a half a cup of uh, white flour, okay? All-purpose flour. So I use half a cup of that. And then I'm gonna use about a quarter cup of almond flour, okay? So I'm using half a cup of regular flour and then a quarter cup of almond flour for our gluten-free friends. You absolutely can substitute this with your gluten-free flour blend. So if you use like a Bob's Red Mills uh, gluten-free flour blend or your other favorite flour blend, go ahead and use the gluten-free flour blend along with uh, about a quarter cup of almond flour, okay? And then we're gonna mix that up and we're going to add a couple of other ingredients to our dry ingredients. I have here uh, about three quarters of a teaspoon of baking soda along with one teaspoon of potato starch. And then I've got here two teaspoons of baking powder, okay? And then to this, I am going to want to add just a pinch of salt. Okay, so we add a pinch of salt there. And let's give this a stir. Oh, sorry guys. And the reason I like to stir my dry ingredients is because I never want my baking powder and my baking soda to clump up because that will cause a very unpleasant taste for a very specific region of your cake, wherever that clump is. So you wanna make sure that you give that a good stir. So just to recap, what do we have in here? We have here half a cup of regular all-purpose flour or your favorite gluten-free flour blend. We have a quarter cup of almond flour. We also have three quarters of a teaspoon of baking soda. We have one teaspoon of potato starch and we have two teaspoons of baking powder along with just a pinch of salt. So that's what's going on in here. Can you use sweeteners instead of sugar? So the thing with a, uh, that ADC, ADC is this is a cake portion. And so for sure you can definitely get away with like coconut sugar, for example, um, all coconut sugar, for example, or even date sugar um, for the filling part. For the cake part, it's gonna be a little bit harder. Um, I'm not familiar with, for example, substituting uh, like erythritol or some of those types of sweeteners. Um, certainly uh, using coconut sugar for the cake part will result in a wildly different texture uh, for that cake. Um, but there is a little bit of brown sugar that will go into the cake and I'll show you shortly. So if you wanna try using coconut sugar for all of the sugar, um, you can certainly try that, but it may result in um, almost like a chewier uh, kind of cake part to your cobbler. Okay, so we got our dry ingredients all done. So that's our dry mixture, super duper easy, okay? Now we are going to work on our wet mixture, our wet ingredients. And here I have a larger bowl to accommodate our wet ingredients. Let me clean out my space here. And so to this, what we're gonna do is we're going to add half a cup of, again, coldish butter. It's been sitting at room temperature for about half an hour, okay? And then we're also gonna add half a cup of regular white sugar and half a cup of brown sugar. Okay. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take one of my favorite tools, which is the hand mixer, 
and we're just gonna cream the butter. And by creaming the butter is, right now you can see that it still retains its shape of squares that I cut them into. And what we want to do is we want to use the grains of the sugar to help cut up the butter so that it turns nice and creamy. I'm gonna start at low speed so that you don't have butter like flying all over your kitchen. Let's do that. And then just increase the speed as you go. So we've done a good job of creaming. High doesn't matter if it's light. I would use light, um, light uh, brown sugar. Crystal, that's a great question, as opposed to dark uh, brown sugar. Her voice is so soothing. Oh, thank you so much, Mega. Uh, I hope that's true. Uh, I hope that's true. Um, but I hope I pronounced that night. Is this like a crumble? It is very much like a crumble, but we're going to have a bit more of a cakey consistency to the top of our cobbler than a true crumble, okay? So we've creamed our butter here, and now we can go ahead and add the rest of our ingredients. I do want to mention, why do we cream our butter instead of simply adding melted butter? Wouldn't it just be easier to stick the butter in the microwave, melt it, and just put it all together? The reason for that is because when you add melted butter, particularly to a vegan recipe, because we don't have eggs, we don't have a lot of protein going into our cake to help with you know, building that structure to make sure that our cake is nice and fluffy. When you add melted butter, what that immediately does is it weighs down the batter. Here, however, what we're trying to do is create almost a fluffy butter, right, by aerating it with the sugar grains. You know, sugar grains, you, they're big. It's not like salt. You can tell the difference between salt and sugar, at least most table salts and sugar, because the sugar grains are so big. Well, you're utilizing that as like tiny little knives to cut up the, the cold butter and adding little air pockets into the butter. And so when you add that butter to your batter as opposed to melted butter, there are no air pockets in melted butter, then you're allowing that to bake with some air that will hopefully elevate just a little bit. You're not gonna get the kind of elevation that you would in a souffle, for example, but you're hoping to elevate that so that it isn't so heavy and dense. Hopefully that makes sense. So now we're gonna add the rest of the wet ingredients to our uh, cake here. And here I just have a little bit of, let's see, actually I should have done this at the very beginning. I have here, let me see if I can move this so you guys can see, a little bit of just plant milk. I'm using, I think, oat milk here. You could also use soy milk. I have about a cup and a quarter. And to this, I'm gonna add about a tablespoon of vinegar. I'm just using red wine vinegar. You can use any vinegar. You can use apple cider vinegar. You can use um, a white wine vinegar, a regular vinegar. If you have a peach vinegar, I think that would be very appropriate here. Um, so whatever vinegar you like to use. And again, I'm doing this to create a vegan buttermilk. So I don't know if you all know this, but buttermilk is just milk with acid. Uh, whatever milk you like to use with acid. So here I'm using a vegan milk and to that I'm adding vinegar in order to create a vegan buttermilk. And what that will do, it will tenderize your cake. So you know, like when you make buttermilk pancakes, well, the reason you use the buttermilk is so that it's super soft and tender on the inside. That's exactly what we're gonna do with this cake as well. So we're gonna set that aside for now. And to this, we are also gonna add a little bit of vanilla, okay? So for vanilla, does it improve the taste? No, e radio you actually don't taste it. Um, as I mentioned, what you're trying to do is you're using that acid to help tenderize the batter. That's all it is. So you don't taste the vinegar when you're making buttermilk pancakes. But, you know, if you've ever tried to drink a glass of buttermilk, <laughs> it's, it's not exactly something you like to drink by itself. And yet you add it to a lot of your sweet desserts to make sure they're super soft and delicious. Um, so we're just gonna add a little bit of vanilla extract 
And the reason we're adding vanilla extract is a little bit for the vanilla flavor. But for me, I also like to add vanilla extract because sometimes, you know, the milk or the butter, it can have like sort of a strange or not what you want aftertaste. And vanilla does a wonderful job of masking any extraneous flavors that maybe you don't want. This is particularly true when you're baking gluten-free. I've noticed that oftentimes when I bake with gluten-free flour blends, you know, the chickpea flour or, you know, some of the potato starch, you know, that kind of lends this almost metallic flavor to my flour that I really don't like. Well, vanilla is going to do a phenomenal job of covering all those flavors so that you don't taste them in your final product. Sometimes I use lime or, uh, oh, that's a great idea, asexual atheist. Okay, so now that we have butter milk to our milked, um, we're just going to add that here. Okay. Can we use almond extract? I love using almond extract, ADC, ADC. The only thing, again, particularly because we've already added some almond flour here, is I would use a very little amount of almond extract. I think you could get away with a tablespoon of vanilla extract here. For almond extract, I would stick with no more than a teaspoon if you get my drift. Okay, so we've got this. And then what we're gonna do is we're just gonna give this a quick blend here. Nothing serious. Just get them sort of slightly primed to add our dry ingredients, which was that flour and that almond flour and everything that we kind of made earlier. There we go. have made our cake here and I'm just going to clean off my brushes here my not my brushes my uh, little things over there and what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna get like a spatula to make sure that any you know hunks of flour that are stuck to the side get mixed in there we go Okay, and then we are going to, let's see here. Okay, okay. And then we're just going to scoop this over the top of our peaches. Oh, here we go, here are the peaches. Okay, all right. Okay guys, full disclosure, this sometimes happens in a live. This cake batter looks a little bit thin. And I think I actually added the wrong amount of flour. Sorry guys, so we're just gonna add a little bit more flour. <laughs> like, okay. So we were supposed to add actually two and third cups flour, not half a cup of flour. So what we're gonna do is we are going to add just a little bit more flour here. We're going to add about a cup and a half more flour. Sorry guys. I was looking at the wrong part of my recipe when I was putting, prepping these ingredients for this live, but here we go. Okay, that's better. It's like this is awfully thin compared to the last time I made it. I don't know if that happens to you, if you guys make mistakes while you're cooking. Certainly make less mistakes when I'm cooking and I make a lot more mistakes when I'm baking. If you don't pay attention, that has a tendency to happen. But the nice thing is, is when somebody has done a video, you can see what it's supposed to look like. And so that was a little bit too thin. And this, this is the consistency you want for your cake better, right here, just like that. So you don't want it to be like water. <laughs> you want it to be pretty thick, just like this. Not as thick as a cookie. 
If you guys are bakers and you know when you make a cookie dough, it's pretty hard. Uh, you want it to be sort of like this. It's fine to make a mistake. Baking is harder than cooking. Oh, you guys are so nice. Why are you guys so nice to me? Um, okay, so this is the consistency we are going for. And so this is the fun part of making this cobbler. So we're just gonna stick our cobbler right here. Okay. And then what we're gonna do is we're just going to take our ladle. Um, that's just peach juice right there. And we're just gonna ladle some of our batter over the top of our peach filling, just like this. Hopefully you guys can see this. Oh, thank you, Annabelle. That was very nice. I'm glad you like my videos. I like making them for you guys. I'm actually thinking, guys, for those of you who are like super loyal, diehard Korean vegan fans, I'm going to be returning to vlogging. I know some of you loved my vlogs. We did a vlogmas a couple years ago. And honestly, it was one of my favorite things, but they were really hard to make. It took a lot of time and a lot more work than I realized. And so I wasn't even able to make it the full 31 days for Vlogmas. Um, I think I made it to like day 13. And I really enjoyed it. And it was so much fun. And I know a lot of you guys enjoyed them too. And probably the most, you know, in retrospect, the most rewarding aspect of vlogging for me was, you know, creating memories with my dog, Rudy, who we lost last year. And, uh, you know, it was a little hard. But, you know, going through my vlogs and seeing my Rudy, that was really special. And I'm very glad that I have those memories on video with him. But even, you know, more special than even just having those memories, which is itself amazing and extraordinary, I think one of the lovely things about creating that vlog is knowing that there's this beautiful community on YouTube that, you know, fell in love with Rudy too. Uh, because of those vlogs. And so, uh, you know, I, I think you guys know when my Rudy passed away, I didn't talk about it on social media. I, I think people deal with grief in very different ways. Um, and I didn't feel comfortable sharing about it. But uh, the only place I even mentioned it was here on YouTube. And the reason was because I knew so many of you kind of fell in love with Rudy. And I thought it was only fair and respectful to that community to learn that he'd passed away. And so anyway, all of that is to say, you know, one of my favorite parts about vlogging is, you know, creating these very special memories that you never know, like, how valuable they will become later on in life. And, uh, and then being able to share that with you guys, that makes me so happy. Okay, so we're just going to use that spatula to get the very last of our batter. We're just going to make sure. It doesn't need to be perfect, guys. Um, and, and that's a phrase you'll often hear when I'm doing a cooking tutorial because I'm the last person in the world who will ever make perfect, okay? Perfect food. I should do a cookbook called Not Perfect Food because I am not, um, I'm not the perfect food person. If you want that, you're going to need to go to like a Michelin star chef. Like go to, you know, I can cook, Matt, can, Matt cooks, okay? Um, but, uh, you know, I'm more of the Lisa, it's Lisa a uh, variety of cooking, which is kind of experimenting and seeing where it goes and putting my heart and soul into the food instead of technique, if that makes sense. Um, all right, so now that we have this, I'm just gonna go to the sink, gonna wash my hands a little bit. They're covered in batter. We'll do that. And then what we're gonna do is we are going to stick that cobbler, it's beautiful, right? into our oven, which is already preheated to 400 degrees. So let's do that, guys. I'm gonna just do that so you guys can watch me do that. Okay, stick that in there. All right, so that's gonna be in there for a while. 
Uh, it's gonna be in there for at least 35 minutes, if not a little bit longer. It sort of depends on how wet your uh, peaches are, how much liquid they give off. Um, but in the meantime, what I like to do is, you know, cut up another peach to add to the top of my cobbler. Now you're saying, well, it's too late. You just put your cobbler in the oven and there's nothing on top of it. Okay, well, here's what I've discovered is if you try and put peaches on top of it now, when it's still a very, very wet batter, it, it's never gonna cook. That's the problem because all of the liquid that's coming out of your peach slices are gonna prevent the actual cooking of the cake part, which obviously that's, that's not good. You don't want that, right? So what I like to do is I like to wait a little bit until there's, you know, the cake has baked just a little bit. So I'm going to wait for maybe like, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes. And then afterwards, I'm going to add my peach slices to the top of the cake. So again, that people know, oh, this is a peach cobbler. This isn't a, you know, a berry cobbler or a, uh, an apple cobbler or a cherry cobbler or any number of other kind of cobblers there are. So what I've done is just I've cut the peach in half and you can, you know, slice the peach however you like. This is just the way that I like to do it. I think it looks really pretty. And I'm just going to create little rings like that. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. Little peaches of that. I don't know if you guys can see. I can't see what you guys can see. I'm using a phone to do this live, guys. Phone, I feel like, provides for maximum flexibility and mobility. Much harder when I'm using my camera or even my laptop to try and do these lives. All right, so again, got this beautiful peach. And what I want to do here is I want to just cut it pretty thinly here if I can. There we go. Look at that. That is perfect. So I'm going to cut these just like this. So we have a bunch of peach rings. Now, a lot of them are not gonna be rings because you know the pit is only so big. They're just gonna look like that. For aesthetic purposes, if you wanna go ahead and cut out little circles in the middle so that they're all rings, go ahead and do that if you want. Just make sure you eat the insides so that they don't go to waste, okay? I like doing this. All right, now once we've done this, we have some beautiful peaches. Um, what is your favorite cobbler? I know you just named like six. <laughs> I, I really like peach cobbler. I think peach cobbler is the best. So I really love peach cobbler. Uh, I want to have caramelized peaches. Ooh, that sounds so good. So I remember the... Um, other day I made some black bean burgers. One of my favorite things to put as a like topping on my black, you know, people put like tomatoes and lettuce. I always love to grill peaches and, and put like sliced grilled peaches on my uh, black bean burger. I always think that tastes so amazing. So we're gonna have, let's see, we're gonna take a little bit of oat milk. We just did that, oat milk. And I'm also gonna grab a sweetener this is just the sweetener that I happen to have right now. You guys will not have this sweetener unless you're a Korean lady, uh, like my mom. This is Mishidang, which is like a kind of like a plum syrup. But if you don't have plum syrup, which you most certainly will not, um, just use maple syrup or use brown rice syrup or use agave syrup, whatever kind of syrup you would use to put over your pancakes or your French toast. That's what we're going for. So I'm using this because I don't have anything else in this house but plum syrup. And I'm also gonna have a little bit of oat milk. And let me show you what we are going to do with that. We're gonna get our pastry brush here. And we are also going to get our miniature whisk out, which is super hard for me. No, we got a miniature whisk, okay. And then we're just gonna take one of these bowls here and we're just going to add, I'm just eyeballing it here, maybe like two tablespoons, okay, of oat milk. And we're also gonna add a little bit of that sweetener here. Okay, so we'll add maybe about tablespoon, no, maybe two tablespoons of that sweetener, 
Okay, you should totally make a cookbook. Oh, hey, Rat Boy, I actually have a cookbook. Um, so this is my cookbook, guys, the Korean vegan cookbook. Um, this is like the <laughs> pride of my life. No, it's not the pride of my life. I'm very proud of this. This book came back out in 2021. Uh, it's a New York Times bestseller and it won a James Beard Award. So this is something I'm very proud of. I love how <laughs> worn and used it looks and that's because I use it all the time myself because, you know, I don't know about you, but I generally do not have all of my own recipes <laughs> memorized. But if you guys want to see, this is the cake uh, recipe that I am using for the top of this peach cobbler. So if you can see here, I've recently referred to this page a lot, <laughs> as you can tell. <laughs> Don't worry, I have several copies of my own book. This is my workhorse copy. It's the one that gets, you know, the most use. I have pristine copies as well. Um, so, oh, thank you so much, BJT. It's on sale at my Barnes & Noble. Thank you, Carla. I need to buy it. I'm a new viewer. Oh, rat boy, that makes me so happy. Um, I love Jajangmyeon. Jajangmyeon is the cover of my book here. Uh, oh, Asexual Atheist, that makes me so happy. So this is the, um, you can see here, this is why I made the mistake <laughs> in the beginning. <laughs> For those of you who are joining, I miscalculated the amount of flour I needed because I was looking at the crumble topping part for the cake instead of for the cake uh, part, which calls for two and two thirds cups of flour, okay? So um, here, what we've got here, just to recap, is two tablespoons of oat milk plus two tablespoons of sweetener. And you guys are like, what is, what is, what is this for? Well, you know, I'm, I'm vegan, I'm plant-based, so I don't use eggs and I don't use real, you know, dairy milk for any of my cakes or desserts. And what that means is because there is less protein or even lactose uh, in our cakes, um, there is a, a, a more difficult time browning our cakes and cookies and even some of our fruits. And so what I like to do is I like to create, you know, sort of like egg wash. You know how you use egg wash on like your challah or some of your other beautiful golden brioches and things like that? Well, I create my own vegan egg wash. And what that means is finding a little bit of protein. Let's see how much protein. This is not a lot of protein. There's some protein in here, a little bit of protein, two grams, okay? Maybe use soy milk for more protein. Um, and I also add a little bit of the syrup for color because that sugar is gonna create a little bit of browning. And what I do is I take this brush and we're just gonna brush it over the top. I cooked your spicy soup and it was so delicious. One of my, oh wow, Melissa, I love, Love hearing that. The cover dish looks so good. So my favorite things to eat in the whole world, jajangmyeon is like my ultimate comfort food. If you guys watch Korean dramas, then you will know all those beautiful, stick thin protagonists in Korean dramas, this is their cheat meal. <laughs> They'll like save up all their calories to eat jajangmyeon because it is really, really good. Uh, but it's a very rich, rich dish. Now my version is less rich than the kind you're gonna get at a Chinese restaurant um, just because it's, it's hard for me to like, you know, my stomach doesn't do well with that much richness. So I do cut a lot of that uh, richness from it, but it's still so good. And it's one of my favorite things. It's uh, also one of the, you know, best dishes that my father and I love to eat together. Oh, Asexual Atheist loved hanging with you. So, so glad that you could join us this morning as we are making, making peach cobbler. Now let's see how our peach cobbler is hanging. So you guys can see still very liquidy over here. And I do want that cake to have baked up pretty well before I add any of the wash or certainly the peaches because we don't want the heated peaches to give up so much liquid that it just starts turning into a soupy mess. Um, so, okay, so we're gonna have to wait for a little bit. I'm gonna start like clearing off my cooking area while I do that. Maybe we can chat, catch up, see where you guys have been. What have you guys been up to? Um, if you did anything fun for the past week or weekend, what you have planned for today. I don't know if you guys follow Jackie Liu, Jackie Liu Arts um, here on YouTube. Does anyone follow Jackie Liu? 
Uh, yes, super good. I'm, I love Korean dramas. Do you have recommendations? Oh my God, I have so many recommendations for Korean dramas. Are you kidding me? That's like my life. I could do an entire channel just on K-drama recommendations because I watch so many K-dramas. Right now, I am watching The Queen Maker. Raise your hand if you've watched The Queen Maker because love to hear what your thoughts are on that. And um, very good. The last drama I finished was The Glory, which was excellent. Um, with the spice added to the peaches, definitely should smell nice in the kitchen, absolutely. Um, where is a good place to watch K-dramas? I watch all my K-dramas on Netflix these days. I used to have to do like all sorts of different things. Like I sometimes would watch them on YouTube um, or I would just like order the DVDs directly off of Amazon and watch them on a DVD player. I, yeah, all sorts of things. But now, I mean, so many of them are on Netflix, so I just watch them on Netflix. Uh, I'm going to horseback riding in two weeks. Wow. Have you watched True Beauty? No, I have not. Is that a really good one? To go to summer camp in two hours, and this is probably the last video I'll watch. Oh, I'm so sorry. But I hope you have so much fun at summer camp. My favorite dessert, Annabelle, it, like, depends. Like, I would say like, if I could never eat another dessert ever again, my favorite dessert would probably be an ice cream sundae. <laughs> it's so random. I really like ice cream sundaes. Um, I'm particularly my own ice cream sundae. I use um, vegan chocolate cupcakes and I cut them up into little pieces and then I add like a vanilla ice cream which is really the only ice cream I like for my Sundays. I don't like chocolate or fruits or swirly. I just like plain Jane vanilla ice cream, um, a little bit of vegan whipped cream. And here's, here is the secret to my uh, ice cream sundae. I love getting cherry pie filling. You know, it's like so bad, but it's so good. The kind you get that's canned, you can get like good kinds too. Like I've seen like health, healthier cherry pie fillings that you can get like at the organic supermarket, but you could also just get the really, you know, not as good for you stuff from your regular old supermarket. But they come in a big can and I only use a little bit, maybe like two tablespoons, not even. And I just drizzle a little bit of that cherry pie filling in my sundae. And, uh, and then of course, a little bit of vegan uh, chocolate sundae, drizzled, chop up some you know peanuts or almonds or whatever your favorite nut is, very little bit, sprinkle that over the top. And I'm telling you, this is the best chocolate sundae ever. Uh, you should try coconut ice cream. Yeah, you know, I think a lot of my uh, vanilla ice creams are coconut cream based, um, which I know some people have a problem with that, but I don't, I don't mind. Uh, got to about ba four baby deer, two wild turkeys and saved turtle from the road last week. Oh my God, that's amazing. Have you tried the cake flavor Black Forest? I love Black Forest cake. I love Black Forest cake because I love cherries um, and cherry chocolate combination, which is really the inspiration for that Sunday. That's one of my favorite things. To me, I always feel like chocolate cake tastes better with vanilla ice cream. So again, this Sunday is really just like that, like in a cup. Um, and you just, you know, you take that spoon and you go down, you get all the different layers. Uh, Dr. Lawyer paused as we speak while watching you. Ooh, I haven't watched that one. Um, obviously some of the classics, right? Crash Landing, the best, uh, so good. If you guys haven't watched this one, it's a little bit older, is Love from Another Star, fantastic drama. Um, Goblin was pretty good. There's a little sort of weirdness to it, but in general, it was really good. And I cried a lot at that drama. We loved Itaewon Class. That was a really good one. But hands down, my favorite dramas of all time are My Mister, much older drama, uh, but it is probably one of the most beautifully written, well-acted, wonderfully produced dramas ever made in the history of time. It, it almost ranks as one of the best things I've ever seen on TV. It is so, so, so good. My husband, who's not Korean, um, he calls it one of the best things he's ever seen on television. It's one of the best shows he's ever seen on TV, not just best Korean drama. And he's not like a Korean drama file like I am. He's more just like, okay, like we'll kind of come in and out. He did like uh, The Glory though. So My Mister is really, really good. The other one that I loved that I watched recently was Our Blues, if you haven't watched that one. Uh, that is a fantastic Korean drama. It tackles a lot of issues that in Korea are incredibly taboo, 
which is, you know, teenage pregnancy. Um, I think there's also, I think there is a LGBTQ element to this drama, um, you know, mother-son relationships. It's just, uh, you know, physical abuse. There's just a lot kind of packed into this drama that I think is incredibly powerful. Um, there is, uh, you know, a, a you know disabled, uh, you know, uh, I guess um, discrimination against disabled people, disabled families. Um, that also is an issue that is tackled really beautifully, I think, uh, in this drama, and it does it like in a raw, unvarnished way. It's not going to do it in the way that's pretty and romantic and like, oh, everything's happy. It's like, not that. It's like, no, it just fucking sucks sometimes. Like life sucks. Life is hard and it gets ugly and it gets unfair and it gets brutal. Um, and that just is the way the cookie crumbles. And we're not gonna try and gloss it over, you know, and, and make it beautiful. And some endings are not resolved. Some endings are hard. And so that's one of the reasons I love that drama so much. Um, okay, My Mister's Really Good, I also love, ooh, I never saw that one. I think it was made in the 90s. What's uh, its name again? It's called Our Blues. That's the one I was just talking about. I'm gonna tell you right now, it's really hard to get into. I would say the first three episodes, you're like, uh, <laughs> like what's going on? <laughs> um, it's not an easy one to follow, but oh my God, by the time you get to the end, you feel like these characters are your family members. And so when you see them struggle with the things, these sort of life struggles, you're like right in there with them and you just, you just want to curl up and cry with them. Um, but when they go through, you know, beautiful triumphs, you just want to celebrate with them. And I think those are the best stories when they're written in this slow burn sort of way, just as in life, you know, it takes time to fall in love with people, whether they're your friends, your family, or, you know, your romantic partner, your colleagues even. Like, it takes time to, to really you know, grow to care about them. Okay, so let's see, how are we doing here? Okay, we can see that the cake is starting to firm up around the edges. It's a little bit hard to judge again with vegan cakes because there is so little browning that happens. Um, but you can tell that the sides are getting nice and firm. Uh, could you please offer some advice to an intern at a law firm trying to get a return offer? Well. Uh, don't get drunk and make a jerk of yourself, <laughs> which is almost what I did. <laughs> um, I think that uh, your best strategy is to remember that the internship is not just about getting an offer, okay? Uh, and this goes for law firms as well as any other place that you're doing an internship. Remember that this is your chance to make your first impression on not just the people who may be thinking about giving you an offer, but the people who will be working with you potentially for the rest of your career, okay? And that might sound daunting, but it's 100% true. If you look at this merely as an opportunity to prove yourself for the summer, um, oh, thank you so much, Roller Girl, then you're kind of, uh, it's a wasted opportunity. And so, for example, um, if you do just enough to get an offer, it's not that hard. Basically, the rule of thumb is in a law firm is just don't fuck up. <laughs> don't do things like throw up all over the main partner or like hit on his wife or, you know, like make a jerk of yourself at the partner dinner or, you know, uh, I don't know, get tattoos in the middle of a you know, work day, you know. Do the basic things, show up for work on time, make sure to go to the events on time, don't yawn in the face of the people who are giving presentations, it's like basic 101, so like just be a nice person, you know? Be normal and you'll probably get an offer because the offer rate, at least when I was interning, was 99%. But what is really, really cool about this is that when I was a summer intern, I made an impression on a lot of people so that when I started at the firm full time, I already had a slate of partners who wanted to work with me, which is exactly what you want. And my husband has just come back from the gym with, with Jackie Lou. Jackie Lou. She's a pull-upper. 
Oh, wow. Oh, no. Come on in. So do you guys follow Jackie Liu Art? Um, this is not a picture. Yeah, we're live on YouTube. Okay. Um, so, yeah, Jackie is staying with me this weekend. With us. Yes. I'm also here. My husband is staying with me this weekend as well. <laughs> <laughs> they just came back from the gym. Um, yeah, I, in, I invited my YouTube community to make peach cobbler with me. I made one grave error, which I hopefully have rectified. <laughs> I, well, we'll see. It's still in the oven right now. Um, thank you for the advice. What made you be a lawyer? Love your videos, by the way. I became a lawyer because I was terrified of my life. That's why I became a lawyer. So, yeah. The most productive procrastinator. Yeah, I was a very productive... Well... Yes, I was a productive procrastinator. Cause I, chance. Yes, and then I panicked. <laughs> Is that thing on you or on us? It's on me now. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's on me. So, um, but yeah, you guys want to get cleaned up, and yeah, the peach cobbler won't be ready for at least another 20 minutes at least. Okay. Okay. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, let's see. Hi, I'm a team from India, and I just wanted to tell you that you were an amazing inspiration, and that you've helped me realize how much power. Oh, that's amazing. I love hearing that. What would I do with someone I know shouldn't be talking to, but they're, I feel so happy even though they're toxic and my dad is like them, I guess, Spikey, is that the question? Um, well, I think if you know that they're toxic and you know that you should, well, first of all, you should maybe spend a little bit of time asking why you think they're toxic and how you know that they're toxic. Um, maybe they're just going through a rough time right now and they're being a little bit annoying, but overall they're like a worth it human being to have in your life. But if you were like, no, they're toxic. They're like, make me feel sick after I talk to them or they often make you feel bad about yourself or they make you feel tired or fatigued or burdened every time you hang out with them. Those are like really red alarm bells that this person is a toxic person. And then I think what you need to do is just figure out a way to distract yourself when the opportunity arises to hang out with them. Like if they're contacting you or you know, talking to you, have like a plan in place. Okay, the next time they text me, I am going to go swimming. Or the next time they you know, call me and ask me to hang out, I'm actually gonna text my non-toxic friend and be like, hey, you wanna hang out? So I think that's the best thing to do because if you don't have a plan in place, it's going to be right. very easy to just like go into your existing habit, which is to, you know, cede to whatever it is that they want to do. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, don't worry, we helped her fix it. Exactly. You give good advice so often. Oh, thanks, Annabelle. I don't know if it is good advice. <laughs> Hopefully it is. Um, all right, let's go check. I love watching your videos. I'm so glad, Skylar. That makes me very happy, especially because sometimes I feel like I need confidence, confidence boost as well. Okay, so look at that. Our cobbler is getting nice and stiff. So what we're gonna do is we're going to start adding our toppings to our cobbler. So first I need a trivet. What is it? Where are my trivets? I can't find my trivets. No, this is always the, the thing that happens. When I don't need a trivet, there's like 5,000 trivets all around me. But when I do need a trivet, I can't find a single one. So now I'm in my, ah, here we go, studio. That is not my kitchen, it's my studio. A lot of people think it's my kitchen. And I've got a trivet here. What's your go-to comfort food? This is my go-to comfort food, <laughs> jajangmyeon. Okay, and let's get oven mitt. And we're going to, okay, this is a little too heavy for me to do one-handed. So I'm gonna stick this over here. You guys can watch me grab that. you guys. So what I'm going to do is take my wash here and I'm just going to very gently brush the top with my wash. 
This is my combination of oat milk plus sweetener. I used a uh, plum syrup, but you can use maple syrup, agave syrup, whatever syrup you like. I'm just gonna give that a good wash here. And then we're going to start layering our peaches. I actually don't even wanna layer. I'm just gonna put them around in a circle like this. There we go. See on top. There you go. Mm. Let's do like a nice thin one in the middle like that. Like that. Okay, so now everyone will know, oh yeah, those are peaches. <laughs> this must be a peach crawl, but wouldn't it be fun if I put peaches on here and then like inside it was cherries? <laughs> be very, very um, deceptive, misleading. And then we're gonna just take that wash that we created and we're just gonna put it over the top of our peaches too, because I think that will help with the caramelization. Just do that. And we need the recipe, it looks awesome. Okay, I will put the recipe in the description when I post this to my channel, how about that? I'm not vegan, but your food looks so good. Oh, thanks, Serenity. Luckily for me, you do not need to be vegan to like or eat my food. In fact, my food is good for everyone, including vegans. The only thing is this one, uh, like I said, you do need to use a gluten-free flour bed blend if you are gluten intolerant. And that way it becomes a very easy gluten-free recipe as well. Okay, we're gonna put this back into our oven for another like 20 minutes or so. There we go. And now we are done with that part. And uh, yeah, okay, save me a slice, sounds very devious, I like that idea. Uh, hi to the urge to reach into the screen and politely ask for a slice, you can totally do that anytime. I wish I could somehow, you know, penetrate the screen and give you a slice. Why can't my user just be Emma Peaches are on my five top, ooh, uh, peaches are on my top fave fruits. I love peaches as well, I love peaches, nectarines, um, I also love really good apples, like a Honeycrisp apple, a really good Red Delicious or Golden Delicious apples. I feel like those are amazing. Um, and strawberries are good. It's hard to beat a really good strawberry. Uh, what else do I really like? I love honeydew. Love honeydew, fresh pineapples. I just love fruits. Um, this is a message held for you review. That's okay, why can't... Um, Let's see, I like canned peaches better than fresh ones, maybe. Maybe it's because you just haven't had access to really good fresh peaches. That could be it. You remind me of that woman that does yoga and has her own like training clothes brand. Oh, so that's actually my friend, Cassie at Blogilates. She and I became friends through YouTube and she actually um, lives by me, so we hang out a lot. We were in Cannes together recently. We went to France. Um, few weeks ago and it was just like one of those weird situations where she happened to be there at the same time I was going to be there and like we literally ran into each other at the airport on our way to France and it was like the most beautiful like awesome time and we hung out with each other a lot and it was just so so cool and it's so much fun um uh, let's see you remind me of that uh like can peaches okay bye adc adc it was so love hanging with you um so yeah i've been on live for an hour and eight minutes and 44 seconds we've been here for a minute uh not sure if we're gonna have the ability to hang out until the peach cobbler is completely done because right now it's just a sit and wait time uh, so we're just going to sit and wait for a little bit, if you don't mind hanging out and sitting and waiting. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to maybe clean up a little bit here because it is 
sort of a right mess, uh, which is always what happens when I, especially when I'm baking. Uh, I love both you and Cassie's videos. Had no idea you both were friends. Yeah, we just recently became friends. Um, but I think Cassie is one of the most extraordinary women I've ever met in my life. I feel extremely lucky to call her my friend. Um, she's just brilliant and kind and generous and so uh, smart, savvy, talented, brilliant. Uh, again, very lucky to have her as a friend. So this is the crazy mess that we have created in my kitchen right now. And we are just going to clean up a little bit. Let's leave this here for our next inspection of the cobbler. I'm gonna just throw out these peach pits and these sort of strange parts of the peach that I excised. Put these in the dish. Okay. No, I love this right now. Aw, oh, thanks. Love you, KB. Thank you. The cobbler looks amazing. Yay. Um, so I don't know what you guys have planned for today, but uh, Jackie and my husband and I, we're going to go to Santa Barbara, just about an hour's drive from our house. And we're going to hang out with some friends there and um, just have sort of a chill day. It's gorgeous here in SoCal. Um, not sure what you guys are going to be up to today. I love Sundays because I truly take God's instruction to heart and I try to rest as much as I can. I don't get to rest all day, um, but I do like to have it be a little bit more relaxed than uh, normal. Maybe what we can do while we wait for the peach cobbler to cook is when Jackie gets back down here, she's cleaning up after going to the gym, we can um, interview her a little bit. <laughs> um, gotta clean my house, but I'm procrastinating. Ha ha ha, I totally get that. Uh, I like in the northeast part of America and my peach tree failed, so no peaches for me. Oh, that's too bad. You know my mom planted a peach tree in Chicago and her peaches are really, really small because it was her first year of having peaches. So they, they didn't come out like huge, but they were really small, but they were actually really good, which I thought was really cool. Painting flowers on my canvas. Oh, Melissa, I don't know if you know, but Jackie is a beautiful artist as well. Um, she is very talented. Um, you should check out her channel. It's Jackie Liu Arts. And uh, she is like ridiculously talented. Uh, she is um, an art major in school. She's in college right now. So maybe you guys can have a chance to chat about art stuff when she comes back down. Uh, me too. I like to rest more than you know. <laughs> Clean. <laughs> it's 1.30 a.m. for me right now, but it's worth it because I got her watch this live. Oh, that's so cool. Um, writing a story. I would be very interested to hear what kind of story, uh, Skylar. I love to write as well. As I'm sure you guys know, I do a lot of writing. Um, but yeah, this is my house and my kitchen. What do you guys, uh, think of threads? Have you guys, have any of you downloaded threads or joined threads? Do you ever miss living in Chicago? Absolutely, Aquavita. I absolutely do. Especially like the other day I was watching a show where the people were like, you could see the air like, um, like frosting in front of their mouths, like the, the breath, like their, you know, breathing was getting like white. I don't even know what to call it anymore um, because it was so cold. And I, I was just like, I don't remember the last time that happened to me. And I kind of missed that. You know, I love um, the feeling of like being so cold, like right after you leave a restaurant or something like late at night or like a movie and like your coat is not warm enough for you. And so you're like so cold as you walk back to your car and then like the car handle is like frozen ice, but you open it and then you just slide right in and it's still really, really cold, but you know it's eventually going to get warm. I love that feeling. Like, I miss that feeling. It's like painful, but I don't know why I miss it. <laughs> a horror story. Well, that sounds really, really interesting. Yeah, I totally hear you, Ebony. Okay, so Jackie is back. Hello, hello. We're waiting for the peach cobbler that I just put in the oven to get nice and gooey and delicious. Maybe what we can do is, Jackie, tell us a little bit about your channel for those Ooh. who don't know. Ooh. Okay, so I've been 
on Instagram since the age of 10, which was against the Instagram policy. And <laughs> I was underage. I got... She's I been a know. rebel from the start. <laughs> no, for real. I don't know who was so salty, but I kept getting reported for being underage. Probably because they were jealous. I know. They're always jealous, yeah. <laughs> My potato drawing. Very important to me as a child. Um, so I was hosting art as a youngin, got my account deleted multiple times, but it was always just like a side hobby. And then I never really took it seriously until the pandemic. Um, and then I had all this free time, unprecedented free time, as the people say, unprecedented. <laughs> unprecedented free time or leisure time or yeah. yeah, whatever you want to call it time. So that was like my junior year of high school. And then I started painting again because I kind of let it go during when I was busy with school. Then I started making art and then I posted on TikTok for the first time, literally like completely for shits and gigs. I like was so anti TikTok for the longest time because for me it was like a metric of sanity. So I was like, okay, I'm doing fine because I still don't have a TikTok account. <laughs> <laughs> and then I came and at first it was like purely like memes. Like I literally painted like SpongeBob and then Peppa Pig, I think. Um, and I was like, huh, this is like kind of fun. And then like I started really enjoying the like the video making process and like documenting my art in that way. So then I started posting more. And then, yeah, and so then, like, TikTok grew, and then I started, yeah, genuinely considering art as, like, a viable thing to pursue, and so that's the goal right now, trying to be an artist, I don't know if it's going to work out, but... I think, well, let's just give a little example of Jackie's art. This is her water thermos, <laughs> okay? You're never, there was, there's no other one, this is a one of a kind, you will not find this anywhere, uh, because Jackie hand-painted... This thermos, isn't this beautiful? Who, how many of you think that she should be selling this on Etsy? I do, um, but apparently they, they take a lot of time to make. <laughs> so um, it's so pretty. I wish you could see like close up the detail on all the flowers. Look at those beautiful, the, the you know, the, the uh, level, lovely ombre of, of the sky here and then the detail in the mountains. I just think this is amazing. So this is just a small taste of Jackie's work, but I don't know, like her videos have tens of millions, hundreds of millions of views. Um, and you have like, yeah, like long form videos here on YouTube, right? Yeah, yeah, I think the, the YouTube videos are definitely like the hardest to make, um, but put a lot of effort into those. <laughs> so right now I'm still trying to figure out like what is sustainable for me, but I, I've been dabbling and Joanne has been like, such a huge inspiration to me from Aww. the start. And, like, <laughs> I followed you, like, one of the first people I found on TikTok who I was like, wow, Aww. like, I am so, like, your work resonated with me so much. And, like, all the people who I know who watch your content are just so moved. And I Aww. think I can speak to all the people in the crowd. <laughs> yeah, so Jackie was actually one of my first um, TikTok followers, uh, TikTok follows as well. I saw her artwork and was just like totally moved by it. I don't really know art very well at all, so I don't really know how to do it. I don't know how to appreciate it fully, I feel like, but I just felt like her work really, really moved me. So what's her account again on Insta or YouTube? Um, all of it is at Jackie Liu, L-I-U, art. Maybe I can type that. Is that, mm -hmm. is that a thing that you can do? Uh -huh. mm, no, I cannot. Um, so yeah, it's at Jackie Liu, art. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if anyone finds that account and wants to drop it in the comments, that would be great. But it's pretty straightforward. Jackie G J A C K I E L I U Art A R T. Mm -hmm. uh, her account is beautiful. Uh, I want to tell you that you're so beautiful. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I think everybody's beautiful. Um, you all are so kind. Um, okay. So what's the hardest part about being a YouTuber? Oh. There are many hard parts. Okay, what's the hardest part about being a YouTuber? Honestly, for me, I think it's like finding the balance of like, when you introduce that into your life, there's like a sense of guilt if you're not filming something. Mm. And I think not letting it infiltrate and truly being able to separate work and life. And I feel like that's with any creative profession, it's kind of like you're, you're deciding that like work will be integrated into life. And it's not like a nine to five that you can just leave and then like compartmentalize. So that's been hard for me, I think. Just like if I'm taking some downtime for myself and not feeling the pressure to like make content out of everything. Mm. Yeah, I think that's how about you? What do you think? Yeah, no, I tend to agree. I mean, I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on this, but like, you know, you guys are largely consumers. I'm sure some of you also create YouTubes yourself, but um, 
sometimes I think that there is a little bit of pressure for us to constantly turn everything we do, like every aspect of our lives into something that you all can watch and enjoy. Because I think, you know, one of the beautiful things about YouTube is kind of reaching across you know, the ether or reaching across the void to find connection and build community and, and all of that. But really the only way to do that, as we talked about with that show that I was talking about, Our Blues, is time and vulnerability, right? So if you don't have those things, and vulnerability comes in all shapes and sizes. It doesn't necessarily mean like I sit in here, cry in your face. It could be like me posting funny videos of my life every single day. But the idea is it does take time, consistency, and vulnerability. And so it's like, very much the case that sometimes I feel like, well, for example, this morning when I decided to make peach cobbler for my friends, I was like, well, I could just make it or I could do a live and invite my community to join me and make me, you know, make it for you guys. Uh, I'll thank you so much, A L M A O. Um, so like there is a little bit of that kind of going on, like me wondering, like, uh, where do I draw the line in terms of like, okay, no, this is just for me and my family or no, like this is easy enough to invite my community. Um, so that's one thing as well. What is your favorite part about being a creator? Oh, I think just the community that I've been able to foster. And like, I think there is no other way that I would have been able to connect with and reach people from such diverse backgrounds all over the world, from all different walks of life. Um, and just to know that like the, the art that I create or the content that I produce can be kind of like a gathering place for so many people to connect with each other, not only just me, that's like, I don't know, it's it's so, it's so surreal and I'm so grateful for that opportunity. And I think really like witnessing the kindness of people and how it makes me feel less alone too when mm. other people are able to connect with my struggles and to share their own. Yeah, it's just like, there's a lot of, obviously a lot of hate, a lot of nasty people on the internet, but there's also like so many incredibly kind and courageous people who are willing to be vulnerable and share themselves. And like knowing that you are able to spark something in someone else, I think that's like magical. That is really beautiful. I love that aspect of community building and development as well. And I, I mean, and I'm, I know you've had this experience as, as well as I, like a lot of people, you know, here today were commenting their they're like following from all over the world. It's not just like California, mm -hmm. which is really cool because otherwise I would be limited to just meeting people in SoCal. Right. Um, but meeting people all over the world is is pretty amazing. Uh, probably for me, at least in IG, is uh, ended up accidentally creating another persona of yourself just to protect yourself emotionally. What do you think about that? Because Jackie, you're pretty vulnerable in a lot of your comment. I mean, Jackie goes pretty deep. Uh, deep uh, in a lot of her co I mean, content. Her artwork is very raw, very revealing. Um, do you ever feel like you have to create sort of some veneer in order to protect yourself emotionally? Mm. I think, yeah. Like I was just telling Joanne about this last night, but I think for me, when I post something really vulnerable and something like extremely personal and I put it out into the internet, like for me, that's easier than like talking about it with someone who's like not like close enough to me that I would be able to tell them about mm. it but just like someone who like knows me in person but like I wouldn't feel comfortable trusting with that, them with that information so like the internet almost feels more anonymous so I like put something out there and it's like okay like a couple thousand people watch it but they're like strangers so that's okay but then <laughs> if someone like a classmate like comes up to me and like will like talk to me about my videos that makes me really uncomfortable because I think I do have this kind of like I kind of compartmentalize and have this cognitive dissonance where it's like okay online me is like kind of a different person from me in real life and so I still go to college and then sometimes like people will just like come up to me like when I'm working out at the gym or getting mm. tofu in the dining hall <laughs> or like at a Halloween party like one single Halloween party one girl asked me for my signature and another girl like just started talking to me and oh, she was wow. like really drunk and she like racially profiled my boyfriend but it's like people think that like they know me mm. because of like how much I share and I think that that also can lead to some like weird parasocial relationships as <laughs> in the form yeah. of some creepy men who have come my way but it's definitely a hard balance but overall I think it's like something that I'm willing to take on because of 
all of the the positivity. All right, the, the fulfilling parasocial yeah. relationships. Yeah, <laughs> love from Vegas, love right back at you, love from Ireland as well. I love the idea of Ireland. I've never been there. I really, really want to go there. Yeah, I've, yeah, I've, re- I've read a lot about Ireland and its history and its geography, and it just I'm really excited that one day I will go. How do you deal with burnout? Ooh. Um, creative burnout especially <laughs> creative burnout, yeah I definitely got hit with that pretty severely like after my my TikTok peak and I think it also was compounded by the fact that I was sharing so much mm. of my personal life and story and I think that like putting so much of myself emotionally into it it was definitely something that I had to realize that like I'm not this infinite emotional receptacle and like I do have upper bounds mm. um, and so I've been scaling back a little bit and just sharing like what I think feels comfortable to me and I think what you were saying too about like how like sharing things that are emotionally resolved that like was a safety net for you but for me I think I was sharing a lot of things that weren't emotionally Mm. resolved and that was in retrospect like I think that was really hard for me and then just like to have the entire internet in on it yeah um that was a lot and then also like the the pace that I was producing and like the extent to which I was overworking myself which is not sustainable um And so I kind of took a break and I think that was obviously like a luxury that I had because I'm a student and so like I could do other things. I like was able to just focus on school and kind of not really do art for a while. Um, But I think I needed it. So for basically like over a year, I made maybe like two or three paintings, Mm -hmm. whereas the year before I Mm -hmm. made like 70 something. Um, And that was that allowed me to take a step back and assess like, okay, have I fallen out of love with art? forever or is this something mm. I want to reassess so mm-hmm. it was almost like a relate like a romantic relationship to me and I was able to like think about it and realize like okay I fundamentally do love art and this is something that I want to work on and I think like the break was healthy and I'm going to try and like obviously I'm not like back in the full swing of where I was before but I think I'm willing to work on it and like try to make it a sustainable long-term mm. relationship mm. Yeah. I love the analogy of a romantic relationship to your creativity and your process. I think that's such a, an interesting way of looking at it. I was just talking to my brother-in-law, who's also an artist, and he actually, when he was talking about um, like painting, mm-hmm. he'll be like, it's a conversation. Yeah. I'll throw some paint onto the canvas, and then I'll react to it. Yeah. And then I'll you know, say something back to what you know, I'm seeing. And the interesting thing about, you know, people often think that when you paint, it's just painting. Uh, but one of the things that David taught me was, well, it's painting and drying. You know, it's painting and movement because when you, you know, throw paint onto a canvas, it doesn't just stay there like glue. It does things. It moves. It drips by virtue of gravity. And sometimes David uses gravity. He'll flip the canvas around because he wants it to move in a different way or a different direction. Um, sometimes so much of painting is actually watching it dry for 10, 12 hours and seeing what it looks like the next day. It's just like this beautiful conversation that he has with his artwork the paint goes on there. It does its thing. He waits for 10, 12 hours. Sometimes he said that he waits for years. So he'll do something and he'll be like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not feeling what you're telling me right now. So he'll actually wait for years and come back to it and pick up the conversation where it left off, which I think is really beautiful because it means that either the, the, you know, the, Artwork that he was creating wasn't where it needed to be at that time when he left it, or he personally wasn't where he needed to be to continue moving forward with that art piece. But anyway, I know. Hello, you guys are freaked out about the peach cobbler. You're worried that I'm burning it. So let's go take a look at the peach cobbler. I don't think it's burning. Ooh, ooh, okay. So there's a lot of steam happening. But this is when you know that it's very close to done is, can you guys see the bubbling on the edges? That's when we know that we're close to done. So I'm gonna give this probably another five, 10 minutes to make sure, but look at how good this looks. Jackie, how did you come into your own unique style for your art? Oh, I still (coughs) don't feel fully comfortable in like saying that I've decided on a style but it's definitely really yeah I, I still feel like I don't really I'm, I'm still in a phase of exploration and I don't think I have a particular style like there there are tendencies but I guess I'm still exploring um yeah I think it was just a lot of experimentation and realizing that 
I, I don't remember, oh sorry, mm -hmm. what the book was called. It was a book by Twyla Tharp. Is it called um, The Artist Way? No, that was <laughs> Julia Cameron. I want to, to read that one. Mm -hmm. um, but it was something about, oh, The Creative Habit. Um, and she said something about like, everyone has a different kind of creative DNA. And obviously it's like a metaphor. Like I don't believe in there's this kind of like essentialism that like you have an essence as a creator that you have to stick with. But I think that just like allowed me to reframe and accept that like, okay, I don't have to be good at what everybody else is. Cause I remember I would always like get in a panic when I would see someone else's art style that was like, wow, like that's so beautiful. And like, why can't I do that? But now I'm able to just appreciate like, wow, like that's amazing, that's incredible. I can't do that, but like that's their thing. And then I can do mine. So mm. I think, yeah, that was really like a, a huge shift for me because I think I was, before I would like feel like, oh, do I have to emulate them in order to, like there's so much greatness around me, like how will I ever measure up? And I don't think that there's a way to like compare. And I think that has allowed me to just be comfortable in doing what I do best. And like, yeah, just being comfortable in knowing that like I have a specific tendency as a creator in like the, so the style that I create, like my medium, and I don't have to be good at everything and that's okay and nobody will be. I think that's so important. And I actually struggle with that a lot. So I, I really love hearing that because I think a lot of times I feel like, oh, well, I love that video or I love that style or I think that looks so beautiful. And I'll be like, well, I guess I need to copy it now. And then sometimes I'm like, I can't copy it yeah. or it like doesn't work with my style or it doesn't work with some of the other aspects of my creative process. And so I get so hung up with trying to copy somebody else that I tend to devalue my own artistic style, my own creativity. Um, and I think it is important to sort of, like at a certain point, I think you have to just be confident in that, like you have done this for enough time to maybe not have identified a specific style, but at least have cultivated enough taste to understand what style looks like and also to imbue value mm -hmm. in like the things that you're creating. Mm -hmm. um, see, how do you guys deal with parasocial relationship situation? At what point do you guys draw the line? Mm. Okay, well, I, I draw the line. There's been some harassment, <laughs> <laughs> as Joanne may have learned recently. Um, yeah, I think that it is, it's pretty clear when someone is being respectful and they, like, maybe they're they're oversharing a lot but they're they're clearly like looking up to you and they like were very moved by your work and i think and it, when it bleeds into people who don't know boundaries and don't respect you as an individual and as a person then i will just not respond and i think that that's been the most effective way because yeah i feel like responding and kind of egging them on almost just enables them because i think they just want attention to mm, be honest i think mm -hmm. that's yeah, so I think that's like the best solution. But luckily I haven't been, I haven't dealt with anything crazy, crazy. Yeah, I, I haven't dealt with anything crazy, crazy. Um, maybe because like Jackie, I don't, I don't encourage it. Mm -hmm. If I see, I mean, I, I often get like crazy DMs or messages uh, and things like that, but I just never respond to them. Oftentimes I end up just automatically blocking them. If I even get a hint of the creepies, I automatically block them so that they can't ever come back to me on social media. Because I think that as soon as they feel like you respond to them or even pay them the slightest attention, they become emboldened to do more. It's, it's like a drug. Oh, well, this worked even a little bit. So I'll just do more of the same thing. Mm -hmm. And with the hope that it'll continue to work even a little bit. So for me, I just, you know, um, if I feel like somebody is being inappropriate, um, you know, which as a woman uh, tends to happen probably more than we would like as we get some sort of attention. I'm a married woman. Um, and so I try to keep my communication with men like totally uh, copacetic, like something that I'd be like very comfortable sharing with my husband, like if he were watching my DMs or something like that. And so if I feel like a man is starting to cross that line and be a little bit overly friendly with me or intimate with me, I, that that gets nixed very quickly. Mm -hmm. I actually just got a DM. Really? Like, yesterday. Oh my god. <laughs> it was so funny. Um, he said, 
Hi, I'm lucky to meet such a beautiful lady. Can I ask you a question? And then I didn't respond. And then he said, Are you not very active on IG? You don't want to talk to me. Is it because I'm not polite or sincere enough? Why didn't you reply to me after reading the message? So, <laughs> so I mean, that's like pretty regular. Like, I have received some unsolicited, inappropriate photos in my DM. Oh my god! Yeah. Okay, that's never was... happened to me. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's really disturbing, but I think the best thing that I can do is just laugh it off and not respond. Yeah, I think that is the best thing, except when it starts to feel dangerous. Yeah. Then I always recommend call the police, even if they don't do anything, which is 99% of the time they're not going to do anything. But at least there's some sort of record that you, you out there that this happened uh, in case more happens. And then you can have a record and a paper trail uh, developing a habit in case you need to take action against that person. Okay, what is your favorite dish? Or what dish brings you back home after a hard day, Jackie? Oh... I feel like that's a hard one. <laughs> yeah. I want to hear yours. I would say it's that jajangmyeon again that I showed mm. you on the cover of my book. I love that dish. Um, I have to say this peach cobbler that we're making right now, I made two of – do I make two of them? Yeah, I made two of them last week. Um, actually, I think I made three of them. I made a lot of them last week, <laughs> and it was really, really good to eat it kind of cold the next day. Um, with a little bit of ice cream. So that's pretty good. Uh, what's, uh, let's see. I had someone send me red roses as a pick, but it was much older gentleman, so I blocked him. Probably a good call. Mm -hmm. Some people feel like they're entitled to your response when they are really not. These are definitely the ones you want to block. Yeah. I totally agree with that, Aquavita. I kind of uh, liken it to, you know, when I go running, and Jackie runs as well. She walks, runs. Mm -hmm. uh, I think she even does a lot of bicycling. A lot of times I'll get the, like, you know, hooting and the whistling uh, from men while I'm, you know, walking or running or or they'll try and, and start a conversation with me, which is like, you know, again, as a woman, it can be a little bit uh, intimidating when you're in that situation. But even just like beyond that, like I don't I'm not out here to talk <laughs> or engage right. with people. I'm here to run and get my exercise in. Um, I have a schedule oftentimes during the day and I have a very limited time to do things like run and exercise and get my fitness in. And so I don't want to be bothered while I'm doing that. But a couple of times when I've just ignored them or don't stop to engage with them, they, they follow me and they get mad at me. Like, oh, you don't want to talk to me? And they like start calling yeah. me names and stuff Gee. like that. And that is really, really scary. Mm -hmm. um, especially because one time there was a guy I was running and he was on a bicycle. I was running and he was on a bicycle That's and he, terrifying. he started trailing me on his bike and following me around while I was trying to run and it really scared me. Now, luckily, there was a police officer like right there. So I like ran straight to him. I was like, this guy will leave me alone. Uh, but it was like a little scary. Um, I never get it when they start following you. That's so terrifying. I totally agree. Um, oh, I'm so glad you guys like our lives. Gray rock them. Oh, stonewall them, I guess. Press the song, steel heart, she is gone. Thanks. I don't know what that means. All right, let's go check on our peach cobbler. Hopefully it's done by now because, like, the oven is so hot in my house. I'm starting to get really sweaty. Okay. Oh, what's the temperature you It's 400. Okay. Yeah, that looks pretty amazing. I think I'm going to take it out. Oh, can you grab that stand over there? So we're going to take the peach cobbler out of the oven. And... You guys will at least be able to see the final product. Are these like the discard pile? Oh, uh, yeah, you can have some oh, if you'd like. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Ooh, this looks absolutely stunning. Ooh, wait, you know what? I oh my god, this is so good. Yeah, I don't think it's done yet, guys. I can still see it's jiggly. So we're going to have to wait a little bit longer. Oh. Is this nectarine or a yellow peach? Uh, no, these are just peaches, yellow mm. peaches. Yeah. So, sorry, guys. It's still not done. Here, I can show you guys how I know it's not done. So, when you open this. You can see, right? You can see that jiggling in the middle. So, there's no jiggling on the sides, which means that the sides are done. Um, and I can kind of press in and it bounces back. But the middle, which is the part that's farthest away, 
from the hot part of your cast iron that isn't yet cooked. So we are going to give it hopefully just another 10 minutes or so. So it can take a little bit longer than you would like. Make sure you build in plenty of time to make your things. That reminds me of me and my sisters. Everyone goes to war for little scraps when there is something probably much better prepared. <laughs> That's such a good point. We're down to the last bit of peach discard. Is it good? So good. Oh, yeah. yeah, so we got these peaches um, at the farmer's market this morning here in Westlake. And let me see, I'm gonna give it a try myself. Mm. Mm. Oh my God. Can you just oh. eat this by itself? You don't need to put it in a cobbler. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. All right, guys, I'm gonna stay here for 10 more minutes with the hope that the cobbler is done by then. And I can show you. But if it's not, I will have to move on with the rest of my day because um, a hundred minute live is uh, pretty obscene, <laughs> I would have to say. Uh, those peaches look great. I think that the chaos in the world is due to not finding our application for what just is. Grow with what we have, not what want others, what others have. Do you ever deal with that, like um, depression from envy? Hmm. I feel like I don't really get envious just because I don't know. I think I've tried for a long time, like dealing with a lot of family shit back in starting in like middle school. I tried to center myself around gratitude. So that has really grounded me through a lot of tough times. And I think just being grateful for the people I have in like my circumstances and being alive um, has really helped. And yeah, I think for me, the depression, it's, it's sometimes, it's like when I feel this like inexplicable sadness and like gratitude or like reframing things isn't able to dispel it. It just feels like it's out of my control. And I think that, yeah, like that's when I get really desperate because usually I'm able to like pretty quickly bounce back emotionally, but then sometimes like some, it's probably like some brain chemistry going whack, but like it makes you feel so powerless and helpless when it just feels like there's like a dark cloud that's like suffocating you. Mm, like, mm -hmm. yeah. And I don't, I feel like I don't really know how to dispel it per se, but other than like time does help. And sometimes it's just like where you are in life and circumstances, but it does get better. It does get better. Well, I think that's a really interesting point when you say that you try to ground yourself in gratitude. How do you do that when you do feel overwhelmed by not necessarily feelings of sadness, but the mm -hmm. things that are happening out of your control. Like mm -hmm. you're not in control of the way that your mother reacts when you eat a certain food. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not in control of your friend being a jerk and betraying you and I don't know, telling all your secrets to the whole world. Or mm -hmm. you're not in control when uh, your professor is being a total jerk and not understanding of your circumstances or mm -hmm. whatever. They're, these are things that probably happen to a lot of people. How do you in that situation say, okay, I'm gonna ground myself in, in gratitude? I think I try to remind myself of what I do have and like from a lens of like abundance instead of deficit it's really hard it definitely has taken practice when I was in high school I used to keep like a gratitude journal mm. where like every day I would write like three things I was grateful for from the day um I stopped doing that because eventually like I think my personality is just not very conducive to daily journaling because I put a lot of pressure on myself to do it every single day and then like write in more and more detail and then I would like not let myself sleep until I like finish my journal and it would just stress me out and I was like I found myself living my life for the like me and being like so adamant that like oh I need to remember this exact detail so I can record it later mm. and I felt like uh, it kind of is the same thing with vlogging it's like it takes you out of the present temporality and you're like living for the future or for like past record um so I've been trying to be more present but I think that that definitely like built up the muscle even if you like do it in your head just like think about like things you're grateful for in your life or just in a day like something really pleasant like like one time I had like a really big box that I had to ship and then like uh, a guy at the USPS, like a mailman, he just like helped me like make a little handle out of tape and like help me Aww. carry this big painting. And like that moved me to tears. It was just like a small <laughs> gesture. It took probably like 30 seconds of his time, but I was like, wow, the world is so beautiful. Yeah. And I think recognizing those acts and recognizing that 
like the, the it's a cliche phrase but like this too shall pass that has really gotten me through so much shit because like it inevitably is true like even if you're like in the depths like the deepest depths you know that like you can't stay for, there forever and it mm. will like the sun will come out the next day and mm. I think that that has given me hope and just yeah sometimes it really is like you can't do anything to make yourself feel better other than just like have patience and, and just muscle through yeah, it. Yeah. And it's the hardest thing, but it is possible. So I have this problem where like I, I can get really emotional and I kind of spiral out of control and I get really, really mad or I get really irrational. And usually what that means, I'll lash out at the person nearest me, which is oftentimes sadly my husband. And so like if something really negative happens to me, uh, a lot of times I have trouble sort of controlling my reaction to that. And my therapist calls it going from zero to 60, like very, very quickly. Because normally I'm like pretty even keeled and like happy and then like something bad will happen and I'll turn into a totally different person. And she said that the key to that is sort of recognizing that in advance you know, to try and prevent that sort of zero to 60 situation, like go, you know, from zero to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30. And if necessary, then get all the way to 60, but also giving yourself the chance to like, when you're at 30, say, you know what, I'm good now. I'm going to turn back around to 20 and 10 and go back to zero. But she said, Joanne, a lot of times you just go from zero to 60 so instantly. And when that happens is there's no turning back unfortunately. Mm -hmm. You just have to muscle through it. You just have to like ride through the negativity, ride through the ugly feelings and know that it'll pass as opposed to feeling like, oh, I'm just stuck here for the rest of my life. And so sometimes like knowing that there's just nothing you can do about a shitty situation, even if it's maybe one that you helped to create and you just have to muscle through it. And then when you're on the other side of it, then you can sort of rationally and reasonably think, okay, uh, how do I roll this back, damage control, or get to a position where I'm feeling a little bit better or healing myself or helping myself? And then also, how do I prevent this happening, you know, a second time, a third time, a fourth time? That's mm -hmm. always sort of the key. Um, let's see. Um, okay, we've done uh, five minutes. So let's do, uh, no, the cobbler is still in the oven. I know, did the peach cobbler happen already? No, it has, it's taking a little bit long. <laughs> <laughs> um, can relate to it both. I try to think about monks' lives when emotions start wavering a lot. Learn to acknowledge, learn to breathe, and then think about monks. <laughs> do you mm. ever think about monks? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, mindfulness is helpful. Like, not monks in particular, but, yeah. like, it, it is helpful. And, like, if you're in, like, a really, really emotionally fraught situation, um, then just like, this is not like a long term, like helping you in the long run, but like, even just to like temper it in the moment, breathing is really helpful. I think there's like a, yeah. like breathe in for four, hold for seven, exhale for eight. And just like focusing on like your breath or counting or do like a category game. Like you can go through the alphabet and name like, uh, like fruits that start with an A and then a B and then C or like cities or like, I don't know, like flavors. I, but anything to take your mind off of what is bothering you temporarily can really, really help. Like if I feel like a panic attack is coming on, then doing something like that, just like temporary distraction, that can be helpful and then mm. like help you like regain your rationality and be able to like talk yourself out of it. I think that's really important, the uh, power of distraction. Like yeah. we talked about earlier, somebody was asking, what do I do when I know I have to stop talking to a toxic person? And your brain is sort of wired in this way where it wants to do the thing that it always does. So if your brain has built a habit of responding to toxic behavior and, and giving into that toxic behavior, then your brain's going to want to do that same thing, even though a part of it knows that it's not good for you. It's just that's the way that human beings are built. Well, one of the best things that you can do to disrupt that sort of habit is to just like do something that you wouldn't otherwise do. And it doesn't even have to be related, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, that tip that Jackie gave about, you know, playing category games, a lot of times when I feel overwhelmed, I'll start naming all of the 50 states in the, mm -hmm. in the country. Yeah. And if I'm really stressed out, I'll actually start naming their capitals as well. And it'll kind of break up that sort of pattern that my brain is used to of going down this sort of negative spiral. And so I'll do that. And then all of a sudden my brain's like, oh, we're doing something different here. Did you learn and the 50 States song? In no. That no. in Louisiana. Oh, 
did it in Indianapolis. In no, Indiana. I did not learn that song. I just memorized them by like brute memory in alphabetical order. Um, and I tried to do the same thing with, this, with the capitals, but sometimes I, that's with varying degrees of success. I used to also do all of the uh, football teams wow. by conference. <laughs> um, I used to do all of the presidents uh, wow. in order. Um, that I can't even, I don't even, George Washington, that's it. Um, I can't remember. <laughs> but like I kind of created all these games for myself to help. And also these are great tips for when you're an insomniac and you can't yeah, sleep. Yeah, I sleep. I do that too. Yeah, I, I just go through, like not, like I don't count sheep. I just do the names. Like mm -hmm. that's what I do. Um, the other thing, speaking of breathing, um, the best way to force myself to breathe in a rhythmic way is to go for a run. Um, so I love to go running when I'm really, really stressed out because I know afterwards I will always feel better. There's not a single time in my life where I went for a run, and it could be for the most stressful thing. Like when I uh, you know, was with my ex-husband, we would get into a fight. Um, working out was always the best way to feel better about it, even if like – the problem doesn't go away after your workout. You just feel a little bit more confident mm -hmm. of your ability to like recover from and deal with that problem. Or just going for a walk. Like it doesn't have to be an yeah. intense workout, but I, I find that like moving my body in some way. Yeah. I think it, it's really, really wonderful just to like get you moving. And yeah. And then also I would say like distraction, not in the sense of like suppression or like putting something off to deal with it. But I think like, doing something temporarily in order to calm down from yeah. like the zero to 60 and to like slow down the engine in order to regain your composure and to approach it with like a more level head. I think that that's, that's exactly better. right. Yeah. So that you're not constantly going down that pattern of like spiralingly bad behavior. Um, and by bad, I don't mean like bad as in like you're bad. I just mean like bad for you, like not very effective. Sorry, babe. It's still in the oven. We're going to be at least another 20 minutes. Okay. Great. Oh, okay. All right. I am going to go check. Okay. Oh, wow, guys. Ooh. Okay. So we've got far less jiggle. Um, still a little bit right here in the very center. And I think we are very, very close. And you can see from the bubbling action on the edges. I mean, this has just turned out gorgeous. Um, so pretty. Okay, so right here in the center is where we're gonna get just a tiny little bit of jiggle. So I'm gonna keep this in here for five more minutes. I swear to God, we will stay with you for five more minutes. <sighs> All right, babe. So like 20 minutes? Yeah, mm -hmm. we'll leave in like 20 minutes because we do need to have it cool. Cobbler is a long bake, but so worth it. This cobbler is being a little stubborn. Oh my God, the Capitol song, they played it in school. It was an <laughs> old school political cartoon. Mm -hmm. I feel old thinking Wackers about it. States. Yeah. Classic. Oh, wow. So a lot of people are joining uh, from... Um, so just to recap what went into our cobbler, we took a bunch of these peaches here. And, uh, not, not this one. Uh, yeah, not that. <laughs> this peach, these peaches, uh, which we got from the farmer's market. And we cut them all up into bite-sized pieces. We had a little bit of cornstarch, a little bit of brown sugar, white sugar, and a little bit of cold butter that like into little cubes. And that was our filling. Oh, we also added pumpkin pie spice, Ooh. right, which is cinnamon, nutmeg, allspice, uh, ground up. And then we mix that all together. And then we made a cake, which is when I made my error. Um, we added some flour, which uh, you know you can use, gluten-free flour blend. We also used a little bit of potato starch. We used a little bit of almond flour. We used uh, baking powder, baking soda, a little bit of salt, as well as for the wet ingredients, we used a lot more butter, brown sugar, regular sugar, uh, vanilla extract. And we made a great little cake batter out of that. And then we poured that over the top of our peach filling and we stuck that in the oven and then we made a wonderful egg wash, egg wash using plant milk and a maple syrup to make sure that when this beautiful cobbler is finally done and out of the oven, it's glorious and brown and golden. It's not like that pale, nasty color that I hate. <laughs> um, and we also sliced some peaches and put them over the top so that people know that this is a peach cobbler and not in any other 
kind of cobbler. Let's see what are people saying. Um, it's hard to find good peaches that's near my place. Yeah, we're very lucky. Um, I feel like we got some pretty freaking amazing peaches today. Mm -hmm. uh, it, I do think it's going to be delicious as well. Oh, wow. I love donut peaches. I know. Mm. Um, we got a couple of donut peaches here. Isn't that pretty? Um, I love donut peaches too. So donut peaches. Like a little butthole. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like a real peach. <laughs> um, oh, you know what? I'm probably like um, covering the microphone here. Is that the microphone? I that is the it, microphone. Yeah. yeah, I was covering the microphone while we were talking. I'm sorry. Um, all right. So that's kind of where we're at. I'm going to give it another three minutes and we're going to take it out of the oven and it's going to be done even if it's not. Um, I think it'll continue to cook for a, a tad. Well, yeah, because it'll be in the cast iron, so it'll definitely continue to cook outside of the oven. How are you? I'm doing really, really great. Hey, lovelies. Flap puddle. Lovely to see you. Violet shorts. That sounds so good. Um, let's see. I have been meditating for about two years, and it has eased my short temper. I'm grateful for that. Unfortunately, people around me don't work on themselves. <laughs> Melissa. <laughs> and so they remain unhealed. Oh, I love that. That's such a <laughs> kind way of saying they remain assholes. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I think that's so funny. Maybe um, that should be the way, like, if someone's being a dick, just be like, have you tried meditating? <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, such a, like, low-key, yeah. like, <laughs> shady way of saying that. Hello, Fatima. I hope you're doing well. Um... Chessie Dermis is laughing. I just think that's so funny. We have a huge peach farm, Violet Shorts. Well, I'm very jealous of you. Um, I do not have a peach farm. Although I was saying earlier, my mom planted a peach tree in her front yard and it's actually produced some pretty wow. not bad peaches thus far, which I would never have thought that like it got hot enough for an extended period of time. In Chicago? In Chicago. That's really rough. Yeah. Have you ever uh, grown your own fruit? No, I have never grown my own fruit. Have you grown your own fruit? When I was a very young child, I was in kindergarten, so I was five years old, I really thought that I could grow a lychee tree in the tropics of Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I looked at this YouTube video, and it said to like take the pit of a lychee, put it in a tampon, and something about like the absorbency of the tampon was supposed to like make it a conducive environment. But I didn't know what a tampon yeah. was. I was five, so I asked my mother for a tampon, and she was she, like, like, "Girl, lost her what?" Mind. Is it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Needless to say, the lychee tree did not grow. It did not. Oh, dang it! Yeah, so <laughs> not even a little. No, yeah. I, but I've accidentally grown kabocha squash, which was been. It was so good. It was like a teeny little guy, but mm -hmm. um. So we just like composted the seeds from kabocha squash just like in our backyard in like a pile of dirt and then it just like grew oh wow yeah oh, that was amazing yeah it was so good so this reminds me of a really embarrassing moment in my life which i totally forgot about until mm -hmm. you just mentioned that thing when you were five years old and this is very not vegan fyi mm -hmm. i tried to lay an egg <laughs> when i was little How did that <laughs> I literally sat on it. Oh my God. <laughs> I took an egg from our refrigerator. Oh I was a little girl, okay? And I thought that I, if I just sat on it for a really long time. <laughs> so I took an egg from our refrigerator and I like put it in like this nice pillow in my bedroom. And like, like for days, I would just like sit on it. Wow. And like, I hope that it would turn into a chick. That was very close. Did your um, mom, did your parents know? Apparently, yes. Eventually, my grandma found, like, this rotten egg oh <laughs> that was, like, just sitting in my bedroom. And she's like, what is this? And I was like, yeah, I was trying to turn it into a chicken. That's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. awakening. No, I did not name the egg. <laughs> I used to have chickens. Really? Yeah. Aww. That was like low key. I feel like that may have scarred me early in life and like led toward my veganism. Oh yeah, by the way, guys, I'm also vegan. Fun fact about me. <laughs> um, but so we had pet chickens and they would lay eggs and stuff, but then they were also dual purpose because my mother was like, like grew up in the countryside of China, like no, no, <laughs> no compassion for the chickens. So one day she took our, our pet Ganny, Ganny the chicken, mm. and then she made, I was like maybe five or six, she made me hold a bowl while she slit Ganny's throat with a pair of kitchen scissors, oh my bled, God. bled the chicken into the bowl, plucked the chicken God. in a sink, cooked it into soup and made us eat it. 
Yeah. yeah, I yeah. I don't know. Yeah. You know, so it's interesting because my mother went through a similar experience. My mother grew up very poor and in the countryside, and uh, she has she doesn't eat pork, which is like in Korean culture is kind of like really because <laughs> uh, pork is very much a big part of Korean cuisine. And I asked her like one time like why don't you eat pork? This obviously before I went vegan, and she said that it was because she um, once watched a, a pork being killed. Uh, for food and that she can still like remember the smell and the sounds and, and that and it traumatized her for life and so she could never eat it again. So I think like there's probably a lot of people who kind of even if they're not vegan or restrict their food, there are certain parts of, you know, I think mainstream cuisine that they sort of avoid because they yeah. have a, you know, kind of a traumatic memory tied like, to that food. Yeah, like once you're confronted with the like you're forced to bridge the disconnect yeah. between the food and the animal like and the when brutality you're really, that goes yeah. into creating your food and like yeah. the personhood of the animal yeah like and once you reckon with that i feel like it's really really hard to go it's back. hard to go back yeah. i mean and that's just not with food that's like with a lot of things that happen to you when you're a kid like if you try to lay an egg and you get a rotten egg <laughs> like i will never try and lay an egg ever again <laughs> okay i think guys like we're at that point where I don't even care if the, the cobbler is raw on the inside, which I don't think it is. Um, yeah, I think we're oh, I think we're good. So we're gonna take that baby out and we are going to do the final final present moment of this ridiculously epically long saga live. Okay. Here we go. Yeah, it looks pretty darn good. Ooh, we got a very fluffy little cake topping on our peach cobbler. I'm gonna close my oven here. Turn that off, cancel oven light. So this is the end of our peach cobbler. You can see we've even got some coloring on the peaches themselves. We got a little bit of browning. And that's because we added our vegan egg wash, which is just uh, plant milk along with some sweetener. And we also did that to the top of our cake, which is why we have this gorgeous coloring on the cake part of our peach cobbler. So I don't know about you, but I like my uh, cake part of the peach cobbler to be a cake and not a, a biscuit. A lot of people, they prefer a biscuity top to their cobbler or even harder. I don't like that. I find that to be a little bit too dry for me. So I added just a cake batter um, to the top of my cobbler. So we're gonna have to let this cool um, because otherwise it will still be soupy on the inside. We do need to let it cool a little bit. And then we are going to eat these with ice cream. So hopefully, hopefully, you guys enjoyed hanging out with me for, oh my God, over two hours, geez. Um, and I will be posting this to my channel and I will include uh, the recipe in the description so that you guys can try making this at home. But thank you so much, Jackie, mm -hmm. for joining us. Thank you, all of you, for joining us this morning as well. I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful Sunday Woo! that is filled with cobbler. <laughs> all right, bye guys, bye, 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 bye. Okay, I don't know how do how do I turn this off? Do you know, Jackie? I've never know. done Instagram live before. Do you just like press? Okay. Okay, so this is us not knowing how to close Maybe. this. Okay, there we go.